Continuing with Harish from Red Hat, Harish Pillay, who many of you uh, already know from the community. Um, he supported FOSS Asia over many years. Uh, he's also uh, the individual who's arranged many meetups. So uh, one of the first to introduce Linux in Singapore already back in early 2000s. So just give it up for Harish while he sets up and presents. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Darsten. And good morning, everybody. Oops. Am I making the noise? Oh, you're, okay, yours. Okay. All right. It's, uh, it's very nice to be here again. Um, and I thank uh, Hong Folk and, and Mario for this amazing work that you guys are continuing to do. That uh, is phenomenal. Thank you very much. I couldn't help much this year. I got so many other things to do as well, so I had to prioritize. So my apologies in public to you guys. What I want to do now is to quickly walk you through the next 15 minutes of some stuff that I thought may be useful. And I think the title for this particular talk was supposed to be 10 and uh, Back to the Future. I'm going to ask you to do something, but you need to be very careful when you do this. Could you all please stand up? Don't fall, don't drop, watch your laptop, watch your phones. If your phones fall by the sideline, don't, don't do it yourself, it may explode, so can we come and help you? You know, this is what they'd say in the airlines, right? <laughs> All right, okay. What is 1010? So those of you who were born from 2009 and, and later, please sit down. 2009 and younger. 2009 and younger. Any, anybody here born in 2009? Okay. Force Asia was, was born, right? Force Asia was born. So it's the 10th birthday. I leave it to Hong Fook to tell the story behind that. Now what I want to do is the next number. How many of you are younger, in other words, was born on or after 1989. 1989. Don't be shy. I mean, I, 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 I'm still standing. <laughs> are, you, are you sure, Hong Fong? 1989? Okay, 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 okay. No, okay. So, no, no, no. I don't, no, no. <laughs> 1989 and younger. All right? Wow. It's only a few, okay. What is 1989? This was the first web, World Wide Web page. It's a copy, you can find it on the CERN website. So it's happy 30th birthday, for World Wide Web. That was, I think, yesterday, if I'm not wrong. All right, so the next number, okay. This is going to be, I'm, I'm okay, let me put a bet here. I know at least 50% will sit down. Those who were born on or after 1969. Hey, I, I was right. <laughs> I'm still standing. <laughs> 1969. So I think we should pat ourselves on the back, you know, at least pat yourself on the back because 1969 was when the internet was first functional. The internet that we know today was called ARPANET then. So this is a diagram, a map of all the connections that went through from 1969 December till March 1977, all within the United States before it exited the boundaries and covered the rest of the world. So thank you all of you who are standing, including myself, so please sit down. So. <laughs> Those of you in between the 30 from 1989 and younger, you are part of this web generation. It's not the 1990s people, the 1989s as well. So just remember that, all right? You are part of that. So the internet is 50 years old today. Or not today, this year. It will be 50 years old on the 30th of October uh, 2019 which is what this particular document, it's a log file 
This was the system D log file of 1969. All right, for those of you who get it. I see only a few got it. <laughs> this is saying that a packet was successfully transmitted between two nodes on the first connection between two systems in two different locations in the west coast of the United States. So that's a phenomenal thing in and of itself. It is handwritten. You can still read it. Uh, this is the, you can actually have a look at it if you choose to. It is being uh, displayed in the labs in uh, UC, uh, UCLA, which is one of the nodes that uh, this was run on. So, 50 years old. There's this website I want you to have a look at. It says, the, the, web, the name of the site is how old is the inter.net. Uh, one of the things that I wanted, the reason I put this up here is because I feel that there's a lot of people who confuse the World Wide Web with the Internet. This particular site, as far as this site is concerned, is the last line at the bottom. It says, assume, uh, the asterisk from the top is uh, mentioned here. Assuming by Internet, we mean the Internet as we know it today. That is the World Wide Web. That is, so that is actually technically incorrect. I have actually contacted the author. I hope most, a lot of you also contact the author and say, please don't do this. You're confusing the entire space. The internet started in 69, not in 89. So please help me contact and get, uh, encourage them to fix it. But it's an interesting site nonetheless. Now what I want to do now is to transition a little bit and look at what happened in 2009. Apart from Force Asia being started up, there was a very interesting idea that was hatched. And I don't know how many of you actually know about this. And the funny part is, I only found out about it about uh, three months ago. And um, this is what it is. It's called the World Digital Library. This was an effort set up, uh, initiated by the US Library of Congress and UNESCO to create a repository of digitalized information. This is what the website looks like. Uh, it says it has got 19,147 items from 193 countries, ranging from 8,000 BCE till the year 2000. That's a phenomenal amount of stuff to be able to have been digitized. Having said that, are there only 19,000 items in those all these years? About uh, 10,000 years of human existence, there's only about 20, less than 20,000 items digitized. I'm sure there's a lot more. So I think this is going to be a very important thing. As we look forward, we want to see how far back can we go and what kind of information can we get. And all of this is being driven on this thing that we all use and love, which is called the internet. So, looking forward, what's the future uh, possibly like? What would it be? What kind of world would you and I be happy to be living in? I will posit three things. The first is it has to be trustworthy. I think a lot of us have, uh, you know, have gone through different airports coming here. You have been photographed, fingerprinted. Uh, probed, hopefully not too badly. <laughs> I know some systems made through very cleanly. Uh, the SUSE AI uh, uh, devices came through uh, safely, not an issue. But the thing is, trustworthiness is a very important aspect for all of us. If something is not trustworthy, we have a problem. So what does trustworthy in this context, as far as I'm concerned, is about the network. Is the network trustworthy? Is the code that runs the network trustworthy? How do I define trustworthy? How do I check it? How do I test it? I think we have it in us to be able to try and answer some of this. We have answers to a lot of them already, but it is a constant battle. It's a constant need to, uh, to keep thinking about it, talking about it, and encouraging people to understand it. And don't get into a complacency mode where we say, 
yeah, it's trustworthy enough, I'm not going to do anything more. I think that's when we have a failure of the system. The second one is about ethics, being ethical. We have heard and read horror stories about AI being used for all kinds of stuff, uh, nefarious stuff, and a lot of it had to do with people who created those, not necessarily thinking through all the issues. And I know in software it's impossible to think through all issues. We have been there. So under ethical, I would put three different aspects. One is safety, is it secure, and is it also fair? Now, it may not fall into these three areas uh, directly. Uh, uh, it may not be that these three areas fall directly under ethical stuff, but it helps to think through what is it that you're doing and building that is safe, ethical, secure, and yet ethical, and is fair, and yet it's ethical to do it. And the last one is about empowering. I think phenomenal to see the amount of uh, women sitting in this audience is, to me, fantastic. Women's, uh, International Women's Day was this past, uh, was it last Friday? Or last, uh, the last Friday. So belated happy Women's Day to all the women here. So please, if there's a lady sitting next to you, give them a clap. Thank you. <laughs> so empowering includes three components which I think are very critical, diversity, Ideas have to be coming, can come from anywhere. We don't know where it's going to be the next great idea. But to say that I have to exclude a certain group for whatever it is, we are shortchanging ourselves. And being inclusive and encouraging. We will always make mistakes. That's a given. That's the human condition. A human condition that does not make mistakes has got a problem. That in itself is a mistake. So we need to fix that. But mistakes are a given. So we need to encourage people to experiment, try, and learn from it, and do better. Now, these three things that I just talked about, trustworthy, ethical, and empowering, are a bit heavy for this morning session. So let me change it a little bit. There's another view. There's another view called people, planet, and profit. This is, uh, this is an economic phrase, um, and it is also sometimes labeled as a triple bottom line. So anything that we do, doesn't matter whether you're a corporate entity, you are doing stuff at home with your family, whatever, three parts to this equation, triple bottom line. If from an economic point of view, the cost issues, the cost of doing something, the social impact of that something, and eventually the environmental impact of something, I mean, if you walk out for the, you know, the last uh, maybe three weeks in Singapore, uh, those of you who, who live here, we have been seeing that the grass is getting browner and browner. And that is very disheartening for me. I hate to see brown grass and eventually it dies. And then we have a barren patch and that's not good. Why is it happening? The environment. That's a very important component. We need to think about what can we as a community of hackers do to mitigate that. Now, if I switch this and look at it from an open source point of view, what would be the three components that would qualify in this space? The community, that is you and I, contributors, some of you guys, and the code, the stuff that some of you create. This would be the three points that balance this out. But this, if you accept these three as critical, we are faced with challenges in these three areas. The first one is about, this looks a bit out of alignment, is the code. We, are, we have seen in the last few years uh, force projects that have become co-opted by cloud, public cloud service providers that essentially lock you out as a project that you cannot contribute to it anymore. And also, they do not necessarily go upstream, back to you. Changes, improvements. That's a problem. That's a threat. That's a model. That's something that we need to think about. What do we need to do to fix this thing? What can we do? Then let's look at contributors. Uh, I think it was late, late last year, Australia passed a bill on security that said that 
the Australian government can come to you as a developer and tell you to put in a back door in whatever code that you're writing and you cannot tell anybody about it, including your employer. I want you to just think about that. How can I then trust code that comes out of, in this instance, Australia? Even if that individual is part of an international organization, it's a huge problem. We have to make sure that we can address this in whichever means that we can and make it happen. And all of this is, at the end, in the community. Force licenses. We understand what force licenses are. But in the last few months, there have been a lot of attempts to create alternate force licenses, which, frankly, the ship has sailed, for, as far as licenses are concerned. There's no real need to reinvent that wheel or revisit those arguments. The arguments for that causes a split in the community, because it clearly does not fully appreciate. And this is where we need to go back in history to figure out why we are here today and what is it that we need to do to move forward. So bottom line, no one is going to take away your code. No one is going to take away your skills. And no one is going to take away your passion. It's really up to you, up to us, or the collective us, or the collective we in this case, that we should not let down those who came before and brought us here and especially for those who will be coming later on who are not in this room today. Because it is really up to us to make this happen. And we need to be completely conscious and aware of this all the time. I know it sounds a bit gloomy, but I think it's very important at the 10th birthday when you think about now that you are two digit year old, no longer single digit old, what else can we do? And it's very important that we as a collective are able to do, the, uh, do so. So I'll, I'll end with this slide. Uh, I'm not going to play the video. Obviously, you know who this gentleman is. He's one of my favorite actors, uh, Robin Williams. And in the movie, um, uh, I just forgot the name of the movie, A Dead Poet Society, he, he, his uh, statement there, Carpe Diem, seize the day, boys. Make your lives extraordinary. I think it's really it's up to us. Let's make this extraordinary. So thank you. Okay. Good. Great. Harish, thank you for uh, giving us a bit of perspective there on the community and community efforts.